Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be flipping through this book about Bolivia. We'll look at all the cool pictures inside and we'll read all the little boxes that will tell us more about this country. So let's just dive right in. If I can. Bolivia. Very beautiful traditional clothing that the women wear with their bowler hats. How cute. Little alpaca, it looks like. Up on the lake, I assume. This is a demonstration. It says in 2015 um, against Chile because they want access to the sea because Bolivia does not have access to the sea. Ocean for Bolivia. And this is actually the former president of Bolivia playing some soccer. Um, this is a protest against that president, uh, telling him to resign, which he eventually did in 2019. These are coca leaves. So they're a very traditional leaf that's been grown in Bolivia and this part of South America for forever. And it's um, packaged and sold so that these leaves can be chewed or made into some tea, like mate tea, um, to make you energized. This is in the south, um, where it's very dry and hot and full of cacti. This is Sucre, um, one of the capitals of Bolivia. Let's read about Ilmani, this big mountain outside of La Paz. It says, Bolivian indigenous culture has many wonderful legends. According to the legend of Mount Ilmani, two mountains once stood above the place where the city of La Paz now stands. The god who created them could never decide which he loved the most. Both looked different in different light, and he was always walking across the canyon floor to see them at their best. The god was watching Mount Ilamani one day when he decided it really was his favorite. Using his sling, he hurled a giant boulder at the other peak, and the mountaintop rolled far away. The god cried, Sahama, which means go away. The mountain where it came to rest is still called by that name. The lower half of the mountain in its original place is called Mururata, which means beheaded. Very interesting is in the Benny River on a traditional raft. Very gorgeous, the rainforest in the background. And this is at Salar de Uyuni, the world's largest salt flat. And this is in Lake Titicaca. This is a reed village. It's a floating village where these people live. And they construct the land they live on, their homes, their boats, everything out of these reeds on the lake. Let's learn more about Lake Titicaca. Lake Titicaca is remarkable because of its size, its altitude, and its great beauty. It is the second largest lake in South America, covering 3,200 square miles and has 41 islands. It's impossible to see the northwestern shore from the lakeside town of Copacabana. Its beauty comes from a combination of its deep color, the reflection of the blue sky, and in the south, the backdrop of mountain peaks. In fact, Titicaca is almost two lakes. The smaller southern body of water is joined to the main lake only by a narrow strait. The border between Peru and Bolivia goes through the center of the lake, which means that traffic from La Paz has to cross the strait by ferry, rather than take the western shoreline route that would cross the Peruvian border. Buses and cars go across on small platform rafts, like the one pictured here. All passengers transfer to little speedboats. Titicaca lies at an altitude of 12,500 feet, or 3,810 meters, and is the highest navigable body of water in the world. It is also an exceptionally deep lake, reaching depths of about 900 feet, or 274 meters. The lake played an important role in the religious beliefs of the early civilizations of the area. The Incas believed this was the spot 
where humankind was created. Rumors still persist that late Lake Titicaca holds great hidden treasures. According to some accounts, the Incas threw vast amounts of gold and silver into the lake to prevent it from being stolen by the Spanish. Other legends tell of ancient cities hidden beneath the deep waters. And here's a sweet little capybara. Looks like it just came out of the river. It's all wet. The world's largest rodent. This is a Tiwanaku ruin. The entrance to Kala Sasaya Temple. Another Incan ruin. This is um, on Lake Titicaca. Let's read about the Tiwanaku. The archaeological site of Tiwanaku, also spelled Tihuanaku, lies less than two hours' drive from La Paz. It is not, at first glance, a particularly impressive site because much of the stone has been carried away over the years to build churches and bridges. There remain the Mount of the Acapana, a great step pyramid, and the Kala Sisaya, a great sunken temple. Just visible through the archway is the large sculpted figure that stands outside the Kala Sisaya, which we saw on the other page. Other sculptures include several freestanding statues, two carved doorways, and some stone faces in the walls of the sunken temple. For archaeologists, Tiwanaku is an interesting site that continues to produce surprises. Excavations in this century have revealed that the site was not just an isolated ceremonial center at first thought, but a bustling metropolis that was home to thousands of people. Scientists have discovered evidence of a system of raised fields, which both protected the crops from the waters of Lake Titicaca and retained heat during the cold Altiplano nights. The center of the pyramid has yet to be fully explored. In 2000, the site of Tiwanaku was added to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, World Heritage List. The World Heritage List forms the framework for international cooperation in preserving and protecting cultural treasures and natural areas throughout the world. Another box here, but let's look at this. This is Atahualpa surrendering to Francisco Pizarro, the last king of the Incas. Let's read about the silver. In 1544, Diego Hualpa, a native herder, lost some llamas in the region near the present day city of Potosi. Unable to find them, he set up camp and lit a fire to keep warm. To his surprise, the earth beneath his fire started to flow in a stream of molten metal. Huelpa had discovered silver. This subsequently brought thousands of settlers to South America. By 1650, the town of Potosi had a population of 160,000. It was one of the greatest cities in the Americas. The silver mine from the Cerro Rico, a rich mountain, was taken to the coast on the backs of llamas. From there, Spanish galleons ferried it across the Atlantic to Europe. For 200 years, the silver mines of Potosi paid the Spanish Empire's bills. According to local folklore, the Spanish took enough silver to build a bridge all the way to Spain. The miners descended into the shafts by ropes, worked 12-hour shifts by candlelight, and were kept underground for days or weeks. Thousands died each year from disease, ill-treatment, and accidents. Most of the work was done by indigenous peoples brought in from all over the Andes. African slaves were imported, but few survived the cold. The mines were so feared that mothers deliberately crippled their sons so they would not be conscripted. It was at this time that the Spanish began to encourage the miners to chew coca leaves to help them endure their wretched conditions. Coca had previously been reserved for Incan priests and royalty. La Paz was founded in 1548 as a staging point between the mines and the sea and soon became a major city. Oruro was the site of a second major silver find. Upper Peru, as Bolivia was then called, was soon one of the wealthiest corners of the Spanish Empire, and in 1559, a local government, the Audiencia of Charcas, was established under the control of the Viceroy of Peru. 
the government was based in Chukisaka, which became the political and educational center of the colony. Many of the Spanish turned to farming and became the new land-owning aristocracy. Because the Spaniards took the best land, the indigenous peoples were pushed higher up the mountains, where they lived as tenant farmers, forced to work for the new owners. Let's see. This is a satellite, but it's named after Tupac Katari, who led a revolution against the Spanish. And speaking of revolution against the Spanish, here's Simon Bolivar, the great freedom fighter. Simon Bolivar was born in Caracas, Venezuela in 1783. His father died when Bolivar was three and his mother died six years later. As was usual for young men from upper-class South American families, he was sent to Spain to complete his education. He married the daughter of a Spanish nobleman and brought her back to South America. She died of yellow fever only a few months after arriving in her new home. Bolivar visited Europe again in 1804. During his time there, he was inspired by the works of Enlightenment thinkers and writers such as Voltaire, who advocated for civil liberties, progress, reason, and tolerance. It was then that the idea of an independent South America took hold of his imagination. He returned to his homeland and joined the growing independence movement, which in 1810 expelled the Spanish governor from Caracas. Bolivar was sent to London, where he tried unsuccessfully to win British support for the struggle. He sailed back to South America, but when the revolution was crushed by troops loyal to Spain, he had to flee the country. While in exile in Cartagena, Colombia in 1812, he wrote his most important political work, El Manifesto de Cartagena, the Cartagena Manifesto. In 1819, Bolivar marched his army across the snow-covered Andes and took the Spanish army by surprise. He won a series of brilliant military victories and became president of the newly independent nation of Gran Colombia, roughly covering present-day Colombia, Panama, Venezuela, and Ecuador. In 1824, his army, under the command of Antonio José de Sucre, crushed the last Spanish royalists in Ecuador and Peru. Bolivar had the vision of uniting all of South America into one great nation, and was disillusioned when the continent broke up into a collection of independent countries. He became unpopular as a leader and was nearly assassinated. He resigned as president of Gran Colombia and died in 1830 at the age of 47, worn out from a lifetime of fighting. Nevertheless, to many South Americans, he will always be the legendary El Libertador. This is the Katavi Massacre. In December 1942, nine workers from the Katavi tin mine, along with those from the nearby Siglo XX mine or 20 mine, I'm going to say Siglo 20 mine, demanded an increase in wages. When management refused to negotiate, the miners' union called for a strike. The government quickly arrested all union leaders, and 7,000 miners went on strike. When the striking miners conducted a mass demonstration, the Bolivian military surrounded them and fired into the crowd for six hours. Ooh. The official government report claimed 19 deaths and 400 wounded, while the workers themselves reported up to 400 deaths. There's a statue honoring that moment. This is Victor Paz Estensoro with Prince Philip being honored um, for something. Let's read about the water war. In 2000, a protest in the mountain city of Cochabamba turned into a deadly confrontation that came to be known as the water war. The Bolivian government, then led by President Hugo Banzer, had agreed to privatize all public enterprises, including mines, oil refineries, and utilities that had been nationalized after the revolution, in return for a $138 million loan from the World Bank. This included Cochabamba's local water system, which the government awarded to the sole bidder Aguas del Tunari, a multinational consortium of private investors. The major shareholder was a subsidiary of the U.S.-based Bechtel Corporation. The 
company won a 40-year concession to provide improved water and sanitation services to the residents of Cochabamba. When the water company raised water delivery rates by 93%, the state water subsidies were simultaneously eliminated as required by the World Bank. Residents of Cochabamba protested. Riot police fired on demonstrators and the clash became violent. Protesters accused the Bechtel Corporation of leasing the rain and declared that water is a human right, not a commodity. Very true. The revolt spread to other communities. The government responded by arresting the leaders of the water protest. In April 2000, President Banzer declared a state of siege, and a Bolivian army officer opened fire into a crowd of demonstrators, killing a 17-year-old boy. Further protests resulted in more deaths. The company eventually pulled out. Although it sued the Bolivian government for $25 million in compensation, the suit was later withdrawn. Cochabamba took control of its own water. However, without investment capital, the city's been unable to improve its aging system. Let's read about Evo Morales. As a coca farmer and leader of the Coca Growers Union, Evo Morales found himself in opposition to the Bolivian government early on. In the 1990s, Bolivia was cooperating with the United States to try to eradicate coca as part of the U.S. war on drugs. Morales saw this as an example of continuing U.S. intrusion in the affairs of Latin America, and more specifically as an arrogant, tone-deaf rejection of indigenous Andean culture. Morales soon expanded his interests beyond coca. In 1998, he helped found the political party Movement for Socialism, or MAS, and became its leader. When he was elected president in 2005, Morales became the first fully indigenous president in all of Latin America. He took office promising to bring full equality to Bolivia's indigenous people. To that end, he had a new constitution drawn up, which was approved in a national referendum in 2009 by a margin of 61.4%. He nationalized the country's natural resources. Adopting a policy known as Coca Yes, Coca No, his administration legalized coca farming but introduced regulations to oversee its production and trade. Morales allied himself politically with Venezuela's president, the late Hugo Chavez, Brazil's Lula da Silva, and Cuba's Fidel Castro, thereby aligning Bolivia with the so called pink tide or leftist nations of Latin America. This has set the Morales administration at odds with the United States, a relationship that was not improved when Morales expelled the U.S. diplomat Philip Goldberg in 2008. Morales also ordered the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration and its agents out of Bolivia, accusing the U.S. officials of supporting his opposition and conspiring to overthrow him. Morales is widely credited with instituting socioeconomic reforms that have significantly lowered poverty rates in Bolivia. The unmarried soccer-playing president remains extremely popular. However, some of the compromises he has made have caused disenchantment from the far left. Critics charge his government with corruption and a concentration of power. Meanwhile, wealthier and more conservative Bolivians are losing patience with Morales' long-lasting regime, which ended the end of two, 2019. He's no longer president. Government building? Let's see. This is the presidential palace. What is a plurinational state? I'm just going to read this part. The 2009 Bolivian Constitution added the term plurinational state to the nation's formal name. Plurinational is a word that is not found in many English language dictionaries. It means something like multicultural or multinational. It is defined as the coexistence of two or more national groups within a political body or country of peoples. The term means more than merely recognizing or even celebrating the existence of multiple cultures within one national culture. Rather, it sees the political identities of different groups on two levels, as both part of, and yet different from, the national identity. In a plurinational state, the idea of nationalism is plural. There's more than one nationality. Therefore, political power is decentralized. 
In practice, this gives different groups a degree of political autonomy. In Bolivia, this constitutional change shifts a certain amount of self-determination to the indigenous peoples. The constitution lays out the parameters of those powers. There's Evo Morales again. And here are some people voting, aquí. And let's read about the flag and the emblem. The Bolivian flag, called La Tricolor, or the tricolor, is divided into three horizontal stripes of red, gold, and green. The flag flown on government buildings also includes the Bolivian coat of arms in the center of the gold band. This national emblem includes a condor, Mount Potosi, and a woolly alpaca. The red band in the flag represents the blood of the brave soldiers of the armed forces. The green is for fertility and the land, and the yellow stands for the nation's mineral wealth. In addition to the national flag, which dates to 1851, the 2009 constitution establishes the Huipala, I believe sometimes called Huipala, as the dual flag of Bolivia. The square emblem represents the indigenous people of the Andes, including those in Peru, Ecuador, and parts of Argentina, Chile, and Colombia. This colorful emblem is often used as a flag. It consists of seven symbolic colors, red, orange, yellow, white, green, blue, and violet, arranged diagonally in a patchwork of 49 smaller squares. Both the tricolor and the Wipala fly outside the presidential palace in La Paz. Attractive as it is, the Wipala has caused much controversy in Bolivia since its official designation. One reason is that it only represents the Andean indigenous and not the native cultures of the other regions, and the white, mestizo, and other populations also feel excluded and view the new flag with some suspicion. Some quinoa. Yum, yum, yum. Very traditional food in this region. Shoe shine boys. Shoe shine boys are seen everywhere in Bolivian towns. Most are young boys starting at six or seven years old, but old men also provide this service. Some have permanent chairs, almost like thrones, on which customers climb up, sit, and have their shoes polished while they read the newspaper. Other shoeshine boys carry all their equipment with them in small boxes and wait around park benches for customers. Some carry cell phones on which a customer can make a call for a small fee. To some observers, shoeshine boys seem like an innocuous part of the landscape, but others consider this to be child labor. Boys who have not dropped out of school often wear masks to avoid being identified by their schoolmates. Many give most of their earnings to their underemployed parents, but some are homeless, sniff glue, and sleep on the street. That's unfortunate. The miners. Let's read about the miners. Bolivia mines gold, silver, tin, and other minerals. Some mines are owned by the miners themselves and operated as cooperatives. Life is often hardest in these mines because there is little money to invest in equipment. Most of the work is done using hand tools, with miners working in narrow, unventilated, and unbearably hot passageways. Although no one under the age of 18 is supposed to work in the mines, boys aged 12 or 13 or even younger are sometimes taken on as helpers. After three or four years, they can apply to the cooperative to become miners. Generally, the miners gather early in the morning at the mine and linger outside, drinking tea and chewing coca to prepare themselves for the day ahead. Once underground, they may work for nine hours before returning to the surface. Miners in cooperative mines set their own dynamite to loosen the rock. It can take two or three hours just to chisel out a hole for the dynamite. After the explosion, the tunnel is full of dangerous fumes, and while waiting for the, these to disperse, the miners take a coca break. Miners believe that chewing coca not only gives them energy, but also filters out some of the harmful fumes they breathe in. All miners, whether in cooperative or state-owned mines, have a hard and dangerous job. Even if they are lucky enough to avoid accidents, working in the mines almost inevitably leads to serious lung disease, and many miners die before they reach 50. 
another box for quinoa for health and profit. Not long ago, most people outside of South America had never heard of quinoa. The colorful grain was originally grown by Andean people thousands of years ago and has been a key protein source for the people of that region ever since. The Inca called it the mother of all grains and considered it to be sacred. Outside of the Andes region, however, quinoa remained obscure. Spanish colonists shunned it as Indian food, and for centuries it had a reputation as food for poor people. Bolivia is the world's top quinoa exporter. The plant grows in dry soil and cold temperatures and is highly adapted to the harsh conditions of the mountains and altiplano. The grain is actually not a grain at all, but a seed, which can be cooked like rice or other cereals. Technically, it is a pseudo-cereal like buckwheat and amaranth. There are many varieties with seeds of white, black, red, and yellow. In its natural state, the seeds are covered with a bitter coating, which makes them unpalatable to birds. This coating must be washed off before cooking, and most commercial quinoa sold today has already been through that process. In recent years, quinoa has been discovered by the rest of the world, and the market demand has skyrocketed. Its agreeable taste and high nutrient value has made it a good gluten-free substitute for other grains. This increase in popularity has been good for Bolivia's economy, which has grown significantly since 2005. However, analysts worry that over-reliance on this one commodity could lead to disaster down the road. Also, it has had the unintended effect of making quinoa too expensive for the indigenous Andean people who rely on it. Another box for coca, Bolivia's controversial crop. Coca, not to be confused with cacao, the cocoa bean, is a plant that figures mightily in Bolivia's culture, history, and politics. Indigenous Bolivians have been chewing coca leaves and drinking coca tea for many centuries, and the plant has traditionally been valued for its medicinal, nutritional, and religious applications. The plant's leaves contain an alkaloid, or naturally occurring chemical compound, which has psychotropic or mind-altering alter qualities. The alkaloid is coca. The alkaloid in coca is cocaine. When ingested, it changes brain function and can affect perception, mood, or consciousness. The alkaloid content of coca leaves is relatively low, so chewing the leaves or drinking coca tea does not produce the same effects that people experience by using cocaine. Natural coca also doesn't cause addiction. In Bolivia, using coca in these ways is legal and an important part of Andean culture. Whatever the merits of coca itself, when its alkaloid is extracted and made into cocaine, it becomes a dangerous drug. Extracting the cocaine from coca is done through a chemical process involving several solvents. Most Bolivian coca grows in the Yungas and the Chapare region of North Cochabamba. Coca from the Yungas is used domestically, but the Chapare crop is sometimes shipped to laboratories hidden deep in the rainforests where it's turned into cocaine. This is sent to Colombia, the center of international cocaine trafficking rings. From there, it is smuggled into the United States and Europe. Coca eradication programs partly financed by the United States during different governments in the late 1990s led to a near complete stoppage of Chapare coca exports. However, the market for it in the United States and Europe remained strong. So coca production merely shifted to Colombia. Coca farmers, many of them former miners who were laid off, were never given viable markets for alternative agricultural products and have thus been even more impoverished. Since the election of President Evo Morales, a former coca grower, the government has taken a new approach to coca growing that legalizes the coca leaf for legal products while outlawing cocaine. The environment. Cerro Rico. Oh, look, there's goats. I didn't see those. They blended in with the rocks. Toro Toro National Park. Big deep canyons, it says. Oh dear, you can see the effects of deforestation there. That's so sad. And over here we have oh, a boat in a dried up lake. 
have a sweet little moo cow. <laughs> Very cute. We've got some quinoa grains for sale. And, oh, this is awesome. I love these traditional hats. Oh, sorry. I knocked the camera. These traditional hats. Really cool. Afro-Bolivian men, it says. Performing during a carnival parade. <laughs> a big ol' llama. Let's see. It says children sit on the street waiting for their parents. Let's read more about coca, a part of life, and also cola. Hmm. To most indigenous highlanders, the coca leaf is more than a luxury. It is an essential commodity of life, and survival would be hard without it. The leaves are a mild narcotic, and chewing them helps to numb cold, pain, and hunger. Coca leaves are made into tea and are also used medically. A cup of coca tea is a mild stimulant on par with a cup of coffee and is said to help with altitude sickness. According to legend, the indigenous people once tried to burn a clearing to build their homes, but the fire got out of hand and burned down part of the forest. This made the gods angry, and they sent down a thunderstorm to put out the fire. By the time the storm was over, only one tough little plant, the coca, had survived. The people chewed its leaves and found it gave them nourishment and helped them forget the hardship they had brought upon themselves. Much of the coca grown in Bolivia is just for the domestic market, as it is illegal in many other countries, which limits its export potential. The Morales administration is trying to market alternative coca-based products, such as Coca-Cola, or Cola. Coca-Cola, a soft drink similar to Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, developed in 1886, used cocaine in its formula until 1903. Today, the manufacturer still uses a cocaine-free coca leaf extract for flavor, which it obtains from coca plants brought legally into the United States from Peru and Bolivia, under a special exception to the federal coca ban. Export sales of Bolivia's coca-cola will remain limited, however, unless international drug laws changed be something I wouldn't mind chewing. Although I do have an allergy to some leafy greens. I wonder if I'm allergic to it. Anyway, altitude sickness. In the high altitude of the Altiplano, 12,000 feet or 3,660 meters, oxygen density is lower than most visitors are used to. The first thing noticed is that a newcomer starts breathing heavily after even light exercise, such as walking upstairs. This delivers more oxygen, but also puts more carbon dioxide in the blood. The victim may experience loss of appetite, feel tired, get headaches, or find thinking to be muddled. This altitude sickness is known locally as soroshi, so, soroshi. After a couple of days, these symptoms fade. People not born at high altitude will never fully adjust, as sports teams coming to play in La Paz quickly discover. Even the local people respect the altitude they live at and walk slowly. Bolivians who are not used to daily hard work also breathe heavily if they suddenly have to exert themselves. Here's a lady with her baby on her back wearing some cultural attire. Um, I don't think we'll read this one. This is what life expectancy and infant mortality means. I'd rather read boxes about Bolivia, not just definitions working hard at school and oh my gosh this photo was in the book we went through yesterday isn't that funny <laughs> the wedding let's read about housewife mother activist Domitila Barrios de Chungara devoted much of her life to the struggle for economic and social justice for Bolivian minors as well as the well-being of women in her country Born in the mining community of Ciclo 20, I assume, Chungara grew up in extreme poverty and married a miner. In 1963, she joined the Housewives Committee of Ciclo 20, a women's group that demanded better living and working conditions for their families and their minor husbands. As one of the leaders of the committee, Chungara participated in several hunger strikes. Once when she was pregnant, she was jailed and tortured and gave birth to a stillborn alone in her cell. 
She became famous after publishing her autobiography, Si me permiten hablar, Let me speak, with Moema Viedzer in 1978. The Testimony, a first-person account of human rights abuses and living under social oppression, informed the world about the conditions in Bolivian mining towns during the 1970s. In it, she recounts the hardship and abuse that were part of everyday life. She also describes the exploitation not only by the mine owners, but also by the patriarchal system in Bolivia. In 2005, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize as part of the initiative 1,000 Women for Peace. When Chungara died in 2012, President Evo Morales declared three days of national mourning and awarded her the posthumous Condor of the Andes Honor, the highest distinction the state can confer to a Bolivian citizen. Some more traditional women's clothing. A very beautiful church. It's the Metropolitan Cathedral of Sucre. Some Tiwanaku engravings. Pope Francis in Bolivia. Look, he's got a hat. In July 2015, Pope Francis traveled to Bolivia as part of his visit to South America. Francis himself, the former Jorge Mario Bergoglio, is Argentine and the first pope from the Americas, and he was well received. He used the opportunity to address issues that hit home with his audience. Francis had already established his position that the church must be a refuge and advocate, and advocate for the poor and dispossessed. In Bolivia, however, he went further. Speaking in Santa Cruz, the Pope apologized for the Roman Catholic Church's oppression of Latin America during the colonial era. Quote, I say this to you with regret. Many grave sins were committed against the native people of America in the name of God. I humbly ask forgiveness not only for the offense of the Church herself, but also for crimes committed against the native peoples during the so-called conquest of America. End quote. The Pope's visit came at a time when Roman Catholicism in Bolivia is weakening. More and more people have stopped practicing, and some have converted to evangelical faiths. Some 60% of Protestants in Bolivia say they were raised Catholic. In addition, under the administration of Evo Morales, the country switched from being an officially Catholic state to a secular one. Francis did not merely apologize for the Church, however. He also praised the courage of many Latin American priests and lay Catholics who have stood up for indigenous rights, and expressed his vision of Roman Catholicism as a positive force for peace and justice. What does this say? Do not accept strangers as friends on Facebook. Very... yeah, anyway. Um, I'm reading the newspaper. And over here, so he's listening to an indigenous radio station. Beware of false friends. This is about the Spanish language, but let's read it anyway. Many Spanish and English words look and sound the same. There are two reasons for this. Some words are similar because they originally come from came from the Latin root. Other words have been borrowed from the other language. For example, Spanish have given the English language words such as alligator, tomato, guitar, cork, armada, and vanilla. A few words have even passed from Aymara, or Quechua, to Spanish, and from there to English. The best example of this is llama from Quechua. Spanish also has many words that look the same as English words, but have a different meaning. For example, la carpeta might be thought to mean the carpet, but in fact it means folder. Jubilación is not the Spanish word for jubilation, but means retirement. Such words are called false friends and are something people have to be aware of when learning Spanish. There's a couple of those in French as well. Watch out for llamas or the animal. Look at these fabrics. How gorgeous. I like this one. I love that purple color. That's really pretty. Let's read about it. Wonderful weaving. Along with llamas and women in bowler hats, some of the most iconic images associated with Bolivia are the textiles. Colorful folk weavings have been an important craft in indigenous culture since Incan times. 
Traditional designs differ regionally among the various groups of native peoples according to their own customs. Although both men and women weave, it is primarily a job for women, and children begin learning as young as five years old. In many communities, women have formed cooperative weavers organizations to make, market, and sell their wares. For Andean women, weaving is an important source of income in a region that offers little alternative. First and foremost, however, their textiles are used to make clothing, rugs, and blankets for their own families. Typically, the weaver works at a homemade manual loom using alpaca wool. An alpaca is similar to a small llama, but has softer fleece. People also weave the llama wool, but it is coarser and less desirable than alpaca. In Tarabuco, in the central part of the country, weavers might use cotton or sheep's wool. First, the fiber is spun on a small spindle into a single strand. It is then transferred to a larger spindle and spun into a two-ply yarn. After being dyed, it is given a third spin. It is this third spin that gives Bolivian cloth its strength, elasticity, and hard, smooth surface. The artisans dye the wool using natural colorants made from local plants. They usually create traditional designs using geometric patterns and animal shapes. The results are not only beautiful, but individual and full of meaningful symbolism. Some more traditional clothes. Dancing beautifully. A Hollywood myth or truth? Let's find out. The most famous movie to feature Bolivia is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid from 1969. The Hollywood hit stars Paul Newman and Robert Redford and follows the path of two outlaws who flee from the United States to Bolivia. The movie is based on a well-known story of Western folklore, but nobody is sure what the truth, what is truth, and what is legend. However, historians have hunted through old Bolivian mining records and discovered that in 1908, there indeed was a series of robberies by two North American bandits. Local people knew where the graves of the two bandits were supposed to be and led investigators to the spot. When the investigators dug, they found two skeletons. The DNA tests supposedly proved the remains were not those of Butch and Sundance, and some people believe the two made it back to the United States where they lived out their lives. However, the controversy continues to this day. Raindrops keep falling on my head. Speaking of music, let's read about musical instruments. Traditional Bolivian instruments generally come in families of small, large, and medium sizes. Most typical are the simple flutes made from reed pipes, which are known as quenas, and the more complicated zampoña. The quena does not have a mouthpiece, but is played by blowing into a notch in the instrument. Traditionally, it was a solo instrument, but it is now often incorporated into a musical ensemble. One recognized master of the reed flute is Hubert Fabre. Zampoñas, also known as panpipes, or by the Aymara name of Siku, are more complicated and consist of a collection of different sized reeds lashed together. The sound is produced by forcing air across the open end of the reeds. It is the zampoña that gives Bolivian musical troops much of their distinctive sound. Shells and cow horns might also be used, and drums have also been a central part of Andy's music, although many of the designs are based on Spanish military drums. String instruments include the charango, a small guitar-like instrument with a high twangy sound. The charango is once made from an armadillo shell, but today, for ecological reasons, it is made of wood. Unlike the guitar, it has ten strings arranged in pairs, and the best charangos are prized works of art. Another string instrument is the violin chapaco, a variation of the European violin. Soccer player, Yasmani Duke, it says. And looks like she's making some potato something right there. And this is a swimmer, Sergio Villarreal. Swimming in Lake Titicaca. Oh boy, it must be cold. Playing some soccer. Oh boy, this is the death road. I talked about it in the last video, but it's a very, very high up treacherous road. If you make a mistake, you're done. Let's read about Mountain Man, it says. 
the Bolivian Andes offer some of the most spectacular mountain climbing in the world. The king of Bolivian mountain climbing is Bernardo Garachi, a man of native Amara descent, who was born near the Altiplano village of Patacamaya. Guarachi has been to the top of Ilimani, the highest mountain in Bolivia, at least 192 times. One of the most memorable times was early in his career in 1985, when a U.S. commercial airline jet crashed into the side of a mountain, killing everyone on board. Guarachi and two assistants were the only people capable of reaching the crash site to confirm the situation. In 1998, Garachi became the first Bolivian to reach the summit of Mount Everest. For that feat, he was honored with a Bolivian postage stamp the following year. His goal now was to climb the seven summits, the highest mountains of each of the seven continents. As of 2010, only 275 people have accomplished this top mountaineering challenge. Garachi, who climbs with his son Elliot, has summited four of the peaks as of 2015. Meanwhile, when he isn't climbing for his own sake, he runs Andy's Expediciones, an adventure travel and mountain climbing company. Festivals. This is, it's a car ready for its blessing. Oh boy. It's a, a, the god of abundance, apparently. He's got an abundant lot of stuff there. And look at this costume. My goodness. That is a lot. There's a lot happening in this mask. We have a Good Friday procession. You can see a sculpture there of Jesus. And Carnival, it must be. Oh no, it's El Gran Poder. Let's see, the Festival of Great Power, I'm reading the book. It began as a simple candlelit procession paying homage to Señor de Gran Poder, or Jesus Christ. Since then, it's become a huge street parade. That's awesome. wearing indigenous clothing it says too with i wonder if these are little llamas instead of sheep that's so cute some quinoa lots of potatoes and some corn too yum yum doesn't this look delicious so pancho um beef egg white rice and potatoes i mean you can't go wrong let's read about Chunyo, freeze-dried potatoes. Indigenous groups living in the Altiplano have their own way of freeze-drying potatoes and oca so that they turn into chunyo. Any surplus crop is spread on the ground to freeze at night and then allowed to thaw in the sunlight. For several days in a row, the vegetables are trampled with bare feet to squeeze out the moisture. This finally leaves a light, dry husk that can be stored for months. Chunyo can be added to stews and soups, and travelers take it on journeys because it rehydrates and cooks quickly. So, famous meat filled pastries, some dip, that sounds really good, and some freshly squeezed juice. Some recipes here look at this picante de pollo. Yummy, yummy. And here's some Tawa Tawis or Bolivian fry. A nice big old map of Bolivia, and that's going to end the video for the night. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, good